Madam President, yesterday was an interesting day for me personally, but it was an interesting day, more importantly, in the history of the United States when it comes to the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced in 1923, 100 years ago, 100 years ago, and proposed by a leader named Dr. Alice Paul. At the time, she had just won an important victory. She and her fellow suffragists had just led successfully the campaign to ratify the 19th Amendment, to give women the right to vote in the United States 100 years ago. Despite this monumental achievement, Dr. Paul recognized that just the right to vote was not enough for gender equality, but it was the right starting point. So she devoted the remaining years of her life to enshrining gender equality in every facet of American life, and particularly into the Constitution with the Equal Rights Amendment. Sadly, Dr. Paul and her fellow suffragists passed away long before they could see the ERA become the law of the land. But their legacy lives on today. In a new generation of activists, lawmakers, and trailblazers who are propelling the movement for equality forward, now, the personal side of this relates to the fact that when I graduated from law school in 1969, I went to work for the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Paul Simon, who later served here in the Senate. And one of my first assignments in the Illinois State Senate was to work for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the state of Illinois. The road to ratification has been long and winding. I continue to be amazed by the proposal. Fifty years ago, it really came down to some very basic arguments. And the leading argument against the Equal Rights Amendment was that men and women would have to share public restrooms. When I say that, you think, wait a minute. You want to enshrine in the Constitution the constitutional rights of more than half of the people living in America, and the, artic and the article came down to a debate over the future of public restrooms? I'd have to tell you that had more to do with it than almost anything else. I heard that argument over and over and over again. The ERA is a rallying cry for Americans, young and old, for good reason. As the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, it would ensure that our nation lives up to the promise of real equality. And frankly, it's a principle that should be enshrined in the Constitution. Now, 38 states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in the past half century. The most recent, Virginia, in 2020. 38 is the exact number needed to certify an amendment to the Constitution. The only thing standing in the way of an Equal Rights Amendment is an arbitrary deadline that Congress included in the preamble. Let me underline those three words. In the preamble of this amendment, as it passed in 1972, clarifying that this was not controlling, but simply in the preamble, is what the current controversy is about. During yesterday's hearing on the ERA, we heard from several witnesses, my own home state senator, st home state lieutenant governor, Juliana Stratton, a young woman whose name is Thursday Williams, first generation American, board member of the ERA coalition, senior at Trinity College in Connecticut. She spoke on behalf of a lot of young people. She's a college senior. Her compelling testimony was a testament to the value of her voice in the conversation. I'm glad she was there. After graduating college, Ms. Williams plans to become an attorney. She said, quote, I fell in love with the United States Constitution in high school. You don't hear that very often, do you? She said, quote, what I love the most about the Constitution is how brilliantly it was designed to adapt to the changing needs of its people. She argued that today the American people deserve a Constitution that guarantees equality regardless of sex, a Constitution that we can use as a tool to fight discrimination. She concluded her testimony by asking the members of the committee if we continue to hold back more than half of the people in America from accessing equal opportunity, what does that say about us as a country? How can we be the beacon of freedom and democracy we claim to be if we don't declare that sex discrimination contradicts the American dream? This young college student's pretty smart as far as I'm concerned. 
she knew exactly the right question to ask. And generations of Americans have been waiting for us in Congress to protect their fundamental rights. Congress approved the ERA 50 years ago, but in doing so, we imposed that arbitrary time limit for ratification. That's why our hearing yesterday was so important. The members of the committee were not merely discussing the importance of the ERA, we were urging our colleagues to join us in passing it. This joint resolution already has bipartisan support in both chambers, and I want to salute uh, Senator Murkowski of Alaska for joining us in co-sponsoring with Senator Ben Cardin this effort. We can't wait any longer. I listened to the arguments about opposing the Equal Rights Amendment in this year, 2023. Fifty years ago, the argument was, we can't see how we're going to resolve public restrooms. Now the argument was raised by one of the witnesses called by the Republicans was, we're worried about the impact that an Equal Rights Amendment would have on the future of field hockey. Field hockey. The woman who testified, representing one of the Koch industry uh, entities that have been created to do politicking, said she couldn't explain to her daughter or guarantee to her that there wouldn't be some clash as to whether men could play on her field hockey team. I would say to her with all due respect, and I've been a parent myself, still am, that it's time to sit down and talk to your daughter about the basics. And the basics are a constitutional guarantee of her rights for the rest of her natural life, not the next field hockey game. There's more at stake here. And it probably relates less to her because of who she is and her family than it does to all the other women whose lives would be improved by the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. But that's where we stand today. There's no room for uncertainty when it comes to protecting equal rights under the law. That's a lesson that was driven home last year when the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. For the first time in history, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, the Supreme Court ripped away a constitutional right from the American people. That's never, never happened before. And one of the Supreme Court justices, by name Clarence Thomas, made it clear this was just the beginning he was going to call into question very many, very, a lot of fundamental constitutional rights, like the right to privacy, the right to reproductive freedom, the right to family planning. So now, members of the Senate have to make a decision. In our time, what kind of America do we want for our granddaughters and daughters? A country in which their fundamental rights are safe and secure, or one in which the Constitution still, still, a hundred years after we started, fails to recognize a fundamental equality on the basis of sex. I think the hearing was very clear, and I think the issue is very clear. I know what I want to be able to explain to my little granddaughter. She's only three and a half now, but I hope to live long enough someday to sit down with her and have a serious conversation about this. And I want to tell her that during the course of my life, her constitutional rights in America were at issue, and that we did the right thing for her and for her daughter and her daughter's daughter, and everyone born in America in guaranteeing basic equality.